He's an award-winning chef and restaurateur, and he's going to be talking about ending hunger through reducing food waste. Tom Douglas right here on Rainmakers. Tom, welcome. Thanks so much, Dan. Um, before we get into reducing food waste, let's let's talk about your your bio and your background. You have restaurants, uh, you know, primarily in the Seattle area, right? Yep, all of them. And uh, so I think, as, as we said, that all of the best restaurants are yours. Yeah, we like that. I like that, that, <laughs> that concept. I have one, you know, it's called the Palace Kitchen, and that's at Fifth and Lenora. And so I have five more this direction and five more this direction. So 10 blocks of downtown is, is my domain. What do you think has made you successful? Uh, I think the number one thing is that I'm not an asshole. And I think that that is... Um, I think that that is something that we have to remember about life, is that when you treat people the way you want to be treated, uh, lessons earned, learned early on in life, uh, that uh, you can be successful. And I think that that is just, uh, that's the way I run my business. And then on top of that, we have a, a mission to uh, serve a deliciousness with graciousness. And I think that that resonates with our customers. And, and there we go. So we, now we have staff and customers all on the same page. Are restaurateurs typically uh, less than pleasant to be around? I think that it's a business that lends itself to that opportunity. <laughs> so if by that I mean that it's late nights, it's weekends, or you're around the bars, you're around drugs, you're around all sorts of things that you could easily get swayed by. Uh, it's a cash business. It's uh, you know, it's just it's it's an interesting place that uh, if you don't watch your p's and q's, if you don't watch out who you want to be as a person, that you could be you could be flushed down an alley pretty quickly. People who are fans of uh, the Food Network and other types of, uh, of shows, where uh, you know, like the Iron Chef is one in particular, you were on there. I was on the Iron Chef, and it was uh, one of those scenarios where I had told my assistant if they ever call, say no. <laughs> and uh, oddly enough, I got the phone call uh, from Triad Development out of L.A. And they said, would you consider being on Iron Chef? And I just said yes. And I don't know why I said it, but I said it. And then uh, they said, would you consider going against Morimoto? And I said, sure. And then he a little quiet on the other end of the line, like, are you sure you want to go against Morimoto? <laughs> you know, the, and it turns out he's like the dude. And so, yeah, it was, it, we did it. My first and, and last cooking competition ever. And it was great fun. Free trip to New York. Yeah, but like uh, now you are the dude, though, right? <laughs> I would never say that about me. I'm a, you know, I'm a businessman. Uh, I I think that for me, I think compared to some chefs, for me it's just as important at the end of the day to be socially responsible, to make a profit, to treat our crew as best as you know, give them the best opportunity to be successful and to give back to our community as well as writing a delicious menu and being a good cook. So that to me is what I look for in staff and it's also what I look for out of myself. Social enterprise and in um, helping the world overcome some of the most difficult problems, particularly hunger and poverty are something that on Rainmakers TV we talk about an awful lot. Mm -hmm. um, we have never had a restaurateur on though, especially one who talks about reducing food waste. Uh, it would seem to me that the more food that you can sell, the more money that you're going to make. Yeah. Well, that's just a mistake. <laughs> it's just as simple as that. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a funny world out there, especially here in the States. You don't, you know, when I travel to Tokyo, you know, you never eat all of the food on your plate. You always leave a bite because uh, if you eat it all, you've insinuated to the host that he hasn't served enough and um, he's embarrassed. In Paris, when I go to eat, uh, you never leave food on your plate because now you've insulted the chef because it wasn't good enough for you to eat. In the States, you take home a doggy bag because you've got so much food on your plate you couldn't possibly eat it, and the restaurant tours feel like uh, now that they're successful. You know, so it's it's it, every place is different, and uh, I'm frustrated with the state's version of that because I have to compete against it. And so, in in an effort to lower some of the waste in our own restaurants by uh, always serving too much food. Uh, I, I'm up against the you know places like the Olive Garden, the ten dollar all you can eat buffet, and the, and the big steakhouses that serve a seventy dollar steak, but you know it's twice the size of your head, uh, <laughs> and a baked potato that honestly is a number two baked potato. It's not even like the top quality, but it's because it's so large, people think, oh my God, you know, and they pay nine dollars for it, for a ten ten cent baked potato. So uh, it, it, there's some misconceptions in this country about value, and we've been brought up with it, and I think that uh, it's time to get rid of the some of the misconceptions, like the McDonald's value menu. You know, for 20 years now, we've been able to buy a, a breakfast sandwich for a dollar. And for 20 years, the average employee at McDonald's makes the same exact wage. 
uh, you know, including CPI increases, I understand, mm. but they make minimum wage. Uh, you know, the dollar menu is past its prime. It needs to go away. It's not a reasonable, affordable thing to have in our country. So for those of you who are watching who are from a country other than the United States, uh, yeah, we're talking about excess right here in the United States, and that is something that uh, we are famous for. And you're talking about getting rid of excess. That's going against <laughs> our culture, isn't I'm it? I'm talking about making smart decisions. We all have, you know... <laughs> Thank the Lord, whoever's responsible, but we have money in our pockets. We have a mm -hmm. choice to make of where we spend it. And you can spend it at uh, the Walmarts or the McDonald's, and then their workers can have food drives for each other because they don't make any money, or their workers can go to the emergency rooms at hospitals because they have no health care. Or you can spend your money, say, at the Costco's of the world, where they have pay a better than average wage, almost $10 more per hour than what, say, a Walmart does, wow. and offer health care. And you can spend it at Starbucks, who, yes, charges $5 for a cup of coffee, but their employees have health care options at 20 hours a week full-time you know, full wage. Mm -hmm. you know? it's a, in my company, we offer health care options at 25 hours a week. We tried to make the full-time health care opportunity as available to everyone in our house as we can, because that's my thing. I love the fact that if you want a boat, you have to buy your own insurance, right? Mm -hmm. If you want a house, go get your own insurance. Your life... I, I want, to, I want to be there for you. If you're having trouble, I want to be there for you. And thankfully, I want you to be there for me, too. By and the I, way, and throughout the show, if you, if you want to learn more about uh, Tom Douglas and, and after the show as well, uh, we're going to put the website up, tomdouglas.com. Um, let's talk about Food Lifeline. You, mm -hmm. you kind of um, you know, eat off your own plate, so to speak. <laughs> As I, as I do. Uh, food Lifeline is uh, kind of the invisible part of the food um, rescue system. Uh, people know and have seen, they drive through neighborhoods and they see the lines coming out of the little Ballard Food Bank or your neighborhood food bank. Food Lifeline doesn't have that line. Food Lifeline is this big behemoth warehouse and, and it's, it's got people that operate it, but you never see it. So what Food Lifeline does is it gets food at the most efficient rate possible and distributes to all these food bank and meal program systems throughout Western Washington. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's programs like this throughout our country. Um, and it's, it's a very important uh, cog in the wheel that nobody ever sees. Uh, for example, we found in our research, uh, going out to talk to our, our buyers, which are the food banks, um, that they were all taking their hard-earned, raised money that they got and taking, because th the toughest thing in food banking is to get protein, edible, delicious protein, mm -hmm. uh, they were taking all this money that they had gone out and raised and going to the grocery store and buying proteins because they had bread donated and milk and fruit and things like that, but they had no meat uh, or no fish. And so they would go out and take this money. Well, at Food Lifeline, we can get 10 times the protein for $1 that they can get. So we started the program, this re revolving fund to go buy proteins by the truckload uh, very efficiently uh, and, and getting most of the costs covered other than transportation sometimes. And now we self-distribute that throughout these, these uh, 300 meal programs and food banks uh, throughout Western Washington. And it's just a revolving fund. That's what, that's what these intermediaries do like Food Lifeline, that they just make um, food banking so much more efficient. And on the other side of that, we also have trucks that run up and down the freeway and go to grocery stores and get all this fresh produce. I mean, you can go to a food bank in, in Washington State now, right here in Western Washington. It's almost like walking through a grocery store produce aisle with all the fresh produce we have. Thousands and thousands of pounds. Problem is, we can only pick up half because we don't have the funds or the warehouse or anything else to kind of take it all. We picked up 36 million pounds last year. We left 36 million pounds in the landfill. It's not acceptable. There's hungry oh, people out there, whether they're in the United States or around the world. Uh, we have to figure this out. And so that's uh, one of my projects right now. All right. Well, so you say you have to figure this out. So that's what we do right here on Rainmakers. <laughs> we bring smarter people here to come and talk about that. How, how can we figure this out? I mean, when I hear you say that you're able to pick up so much food from, rest, uh, from grocery stores, mm -hmm. what I'm hearing you say is that the price of food should come down because they have too much in the stores. No, no, no. That's just not how it works. Um, you know, marketing is, is a very well-funded commodity in this country. And so when you walk into a grocery store and you see a mountain of red apples, mm -hmm. the idea of the mountain is and that they sell every one of those apples is that, you know, they build in 20% of that mountain just to make the red apples look better as a group. Well, they don't last forever. Yeah. And so that when they're one day or two days away from they don't want to sell them anymore, they turn over the, the red mountain of apples and they put fresh ones in. And that's built into the cost of the apple, yes, but that display wouldn't be a, a, an option without it. So those, that 20% goes to the food bank system. 
Well, if we don't have a truck to pick it up and then distribute it right back out to a food bank, uh, then it just goes into the dumpster, literally. Uh, and so you're not, if you went into a grocery store and you saw this empty table with six apples left on it, are you telling me you're going to buy those six apples? It's just no. not the way our mind works. No. No, those six apples are going to go to the food bank and they're going to put fresh ones out. Uh, it's like going from a, you know, you know how good you feel when you walk into a restaurant and the, it's buzzing and every table is packed and there's energy and it's fun and, and then you walk into a restaurant, a different restaurant that's empty and you think, hmm. You know, your, your opinion automatically is this place isn't as good. Yeah. Uh, maybe I'll come another night when it's busier. I don't want to be so focused on, you know, it's, it's just different. So it's the same way in food marketing. And, and uh, we just have to have the system in place to take advantage of them. By the way, Food Lifeline it's, itself is, is in a capital campaign right now. And Tom, you, you I mean, you know, I, I promise, sure so, I'm gonna, so I'm going to let that happen. You uh, actually are a, a big part of that capital campaign. I I'm understand. the chair of the capital campaign. You know, I've been on, the, on and off the Food Lifeline board for 30 years. And um, I'm a firm believer that uh, I have been chosen in this particular life to feed people. And uh, thankfully, folks like yourself can come in and, and pay for that. But there's many people that can't afford a meal, and that doesn't let me off the hook. You know, my job is my job. And so that's, I feel like I can solve that part of my job through Food Lifeline. And uh, we, yeah, we're raising a $20 million. We're going to build this uh, state-of-the-art uh, distribution warehouse. We call it the Hunger Solutions Center. And the idea is to become the FedEx or the UPS of food distribution. We don't want that food in our warehouse. We want to pick it up and turn it right back around to the person or the, the meal program that can use it. And that's what we're working on. Um, uh, we're working on training on people how to uh, solve the hunger solution themselves, how to buy a chicken instead of a box of fried chicken. Uh, we're working on, you know, we have so many volunteers. I'll just give you a little, people just don't realize this thing happens, but we'll get a call from Jolly Green Giant in Nebraska. And they'll say, you know, we have 70,000 pounds of cut green beans that you can have if you can figure out how to get them from Nebraska to Seattle. Well, wh <laughs> why, why don't you want the green beans? Well, you know, we have a little color meter and they're the wrong color. But they're frozen and they're ready to go and you can have them. So we call somebody from, say, Santa Fe or Union Pacific and say, would you donate four railroad cars of space to get it from Nebraska to Seattle on one of your runs. And, and oftentimes, you know, we can figure that out. Now, so you're a logistics guy. Well, I'm just telling you what Food Lifeline does. <laughs> this is what makes us the FedEx or the UPS. But now that gets to Seattle. Now all I have to do is how to get it from the railroad yard in Seattle to Food Lifeline. It might cost me $300, $400 to get a trucker to bring it from there, you know, the, the two miles to Food Lifeline. And now I have 70,000 pounds of green beans. And my point was, now, what do I do with 70,000 pounds of green beans in, you know, in 40 pound lugs? Mm -hmm. I've got to get them separated into one pound bags and get them back in the freezer and distributed to the food banks. So now we have 10,000 volunteers at Food Lifeline, corporations all over this town, individuals that come and repack in our repack center. And that's part of what this warehouse is about, of making that more. We can't take another volunteer. We can take more food, but we just don't have any space. So this whole capital campaign in this building, I'm so excited about as far as is becoming even more efficient. You know, we have a 3% overhead at, th at Food Lifeline. 3%? Really? Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Is that amazing. impressive? That is that's very most impressive. Charitable, most efficient charitable organization in our state uh, is right there at Food Lifeline. It's right in our backyard. Nobody knows about it. Mm -hmm. Well, now more people will know about it. Certainly uh, uh, in the Seattle area as well as uh, around the United States and hopefully around the world yeah. because uh, this does go global. Um, let's kind of move away from uh, grocery stores a, a little bit, and let's get into the, the James Beard Foundation, for example, gave mm -hmm. you an award uh, for setting uh, uh, high national standards in restaurant operations and entrepreneurship. You talked about you being a social entrepreneur yourself. Mm -hmm. um, I talked about being part of what I think is important. Okay. You know, the problem I have, you go, go ahead and finish your question, but there is this distinction between say Seattle government in particular trying to put socialist policies on top of a capitalist system. And there, is, there I have trouble. But I am a socially responsible entrepreneur. Well, the award was based on, in, in part, and I have to ask you this question, food use efficiency and reduced waste, is that part of being uh, the high standards of, of being a restaurateur? 
I don't think that if, if you were to ask the James Fear Foundation if that came up in their voting of why I won that and somebody else didn't, I don't think that would be it. I think it more has to do with being a, a good corporate citizen and taking on, you know, we do a charitable event every night in one of our restaurants, every night of the year. Really? Uh, and so uh, just being a good corporate citizen, I think, was uh -huh. part of that. Uh, but also, I am being, you know, I'm 55 years old. I'm, I'm going to die with all these these thoughts in my head if I'm if I'm not careful. So I, I want our business to be, uh, as an throughout the nation, more socially responsible. Mm -hmm. So we hope uh, you're taking notes, by the way, because we don't want Tom to to go away without these well, uh, getting out. Come there. on, this whole thing that people are upset about Obamacare, when all he's trying to do, albeit it's, it's had its troubles, is sure. give 40 million more Americans health insurance. Give me a break. I'm not sure what I can say, my curse words on this show, but I'm Thank so you very much for I am so frustrated <laughs> with this nonsense. You know, we, uh, you know, in Canada, right next door, they have national health care. What's wrong with that? It's, yeah, it's not perfect, but is this perfect? So it's, going no, back to not. the James Beard, I don't, I don't, yeah. I'm not sure all the things that went into it, but um, I was very proud of it, and it's, um, it's to this day, uh, a, a nice accomplishment. But it's better having a daughter that thinks I'm still cool. <laughs> <laughs> but, but getting back, though, then, and, and essentially, I mean, I, I understand what you're saying about Obamacare, but then kind of looking over at people who are hungry here in the United States, uh, I mean, that shouldn't happen, should it? I think it probably should happen, you know, because if if without people getting that, I mean, our country, you know, we just cut forty billion dollars out of the SNAP program, which is the meal solutions for so many poor people in this country. And unless people start to realize uh, what's going on in Congress and, and realize that it's it's nonsense, uh, yeah, we do deserve it, and we should be hungry. But one in four children in this country are are either hungry or in in probably going to go hungry uh, and it's it's a shame it doesn't need to happen but I would imagine hunger happens everywhere in restaurant operations can restaurant tours play a role in reducing food waste well I think we already are especially in this particular city uh, through composting and through that I think if you can take food waste and turn it into compost that's one way of reducing waste mm -hmm. because it's going to go back onto my farm and it's going to become new food so there's there's one thing that we are doing uh, as far as food waste goes uh, there is no way to stop people not eating everything you put on their plate, and that's just going to go into the garbage. And, and uh, we talked earlier about an uh, initiative I had had to try and change the center of my plate uh, to a smaller, say, size protein, and then serve the rainbow of vegetables around it. Uh, but at the same time, you still have to have a full plate of food because I'm in competition with everybody else. If I start sending out little plates like this, people are going to say, yeah, this food was delicious, but I had to stop at a burger joint on the way home because I was still starving. What, we're tr what we tried to do was say, if you're still hungry after you eat, instead of throwing away maybe 10 or 20 percent off your plate because we've overserved you, is have something in our system that we can send out to you to kind of solve the problem. It's such as really hard. You know, you got a yeah. line of tickets, you know, 20 tickets, and all of a sudden someone says, I'm still hungry. Where do you put their ticket in, you know, when everyone else is still waiting for their food? Yeah. So w that's, w that's what made it very difficult. And then, of course, the, I posed this question to my customers, which I thought was the unusual. Mm -hmm. I got a lot of attention for that because I was asking the question. And the customer said, well, you should just offer smaller portions at half the price and blah, blah, blah. And it just doesn't work. You know, it doesn't cost me any less to serve a smaller portion. It doesn't cost me less for the waiter, for the dishwasher, for the janitorial, for the chef. It just doesn't cost me any more except for the actual food cost. So to, to offer a smaller steak, for example, uh, I would have to charge 80% of the larger steak because all those expenses are fixed. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just I couldn't figure out how to get there. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's room uh, to... You know, there's, there's these restaurants that do these huge plates of food and, you know, 10,000 calories on a plate. There's, there's definitely room in our country to change that model. Yeah, and, and I'm sorry to bounce around on you, but I wanted to go back to Food Lifeline just for a minute mm -hmm. because you talked about the, um, the more protein being needed in people's diets. And, of course, that's, that's the, the hunger issue around the world mm -hmm. is, is not enough protein. But um, I understand how you can get more vegetables out to people through Food Lifeline. How can you get more protein out because doesn't it have a, a, a shorter shelf life? It doesn't, it doesn't. For example, um, it used to be that uh, we couldn't take unlabeled food, you know, and we couldn't take any food that had maybe a little dent in the can or, uh, you know, we, we worked just like any other. We would never serve 
to uh, the food bank system of uh, food that's out of date. You know, sometimes people at mm -hmm. home forget that when they're on the food drive. You know, they take something that's been in their back of their cupboard for five years and they put it in the food bank. Well, frankly, we just have to throw, you know, pay to throw that away because we, mm -hmm. we only take good, nutritional, healthful food. When it comes to protein, uh, we were, you know, for example, we got this huge truckload of canned salmon with no labels and no nothing because they don't really want their labels on it because there's laws, Good Samaritan laws in this state, in this city that leaves them out of, um, out of harm if something were to go wrong. What they really don't want is for their label to go out to somebody and have something happen. Uh, and then all of a sudden uh, it's a problem for them. You know, they don't want problems. They, they need to get rid of the salmon that didn't work out or maybe the can color was wrong or it was excess, didn't sell, you know, whatever. They got a new, new crop in, new fish, uh, new fish year is happening, so they got rid of the, the old fish year. But um, it's, it's perfectly usable stuff and we figured out how to get that, that protein into our house. Oh, okay. How and the other thing it? is freezer, freezer cases. We just got, you know, there's a TFAB program, government subsidized protein uh, and, and farming. It's what the farm bill kind of covers, right? You know, mm -hmm. sometimes it's peanut butter, sometimes it's cheese, sometimes it's big blocks of butter. Uh, well, last, uh, almost six months ago, we got six trailers of pork. Now, not too many people can handle six trailers. <laughs> I mean, no this way. is 24 pallets a trailer oh my gosh. of pork in big chunks. And so we went out and we found a, a, a cold warehouse to they donate, Rainier Cold Storage, donate the space for our pork until we could get it through our system. We can maybe do two pallets a week, and here we've got 120 pallets. Oh. Uh, so it's, um, that's what we do. That's what we're, we're logistics. We figure out how to get food to hungry people, and, and now uh, it's just uh, we've we got a lot of protein. So that's how protein comes and goes. It's not what you might think. It's not just a fresh chicken off the shelf. Do regulations need to change to help operations like Food Lifeline? You know, f operations like Food Lifeline, the regulations that need to change it needs to be sustainable funding. You know, it needs, they need to be recognized for what they are. The Food Lifeline, for example, in Seattle is the first responder. If we have a natural disaster, if we have a big earthquake or, you know, tornado or something, Food Lifeline is the designated first responder to get food to the soup kitchens that are going to take care of all the hungry people that now don't have gas or electricity. Mm -hmm. You know, so yeah, that, sh that should be a funded baseline for these systems. Well, perhaps some of the subsidies for uh, some of the uh, agriculture uh, from the U.S. government might change. And yeah, it's change. changing the wrong direction. <laughs> you know, honest to God, this, this $40 billion you know, deal is hitting at the bottom of the food chain. Who, who mm. does that in this world? Yeah. You know, the rich are getting richer and the bottom of the food chain just keeps taking punch after punch after punch. It's not right. You have a farm too, Prosser Farm. I do. Uh, is it wasteful? We just had that conversation because we brought over almost 60,000 pounds of produce from our farm. And I just had the conversation with my chefs and my farmers. And it turns out, you know who's the wasteful one in this group? The farmers. Okay, also. Uh, because they are such perfectionists. You know, oh, this bean doesn't look right. Boom, this eggplant's got, you know. That might be fine for a grocery store, but in a restaurant, uh, you know, number two product is awesome. Typically, it's overripe. Wow, what's wrong with that? Mm -hmm. uh, typically, it's got some sort of scar. Well, I'm chopping it up, making applesauce or making eggplant caponata or something. I don't care what it looks like on the outside as long as it's delicious product and, and uh, fresh mm -hmm. and healthful. So I, sometimes my team uh, gleans too much of the product into sending over because they're so proud. They want it to be perfect when it shows up for the chefs. But I want everything. So I think we could probably add 5,000 pounds to our, our total if we were to be less picky about what we send over. You know, it's so interesting to hear you talk about this because when I travel in other countries, that's never an issue. The, it's never an issue about how good the food looks mm -hmm. on your plate. It's yeah. an issue, can we get it to the plate without yeah. it uh, you know, uh, losing its value ahead of time? Well, we, we, yeah, absolutely. But I, I, I don't want to fail to mention that um, you know, farmers sometimes don't plan as much as they can because they, either the market doesn't uh, need it or uh, for, for some reason or another. If we can have farmers talk with food banks, okay, what is, what is it that you need? And then we'll go ahead and plant this strip that we don't really need for us this year, but we'll plant it for the food bank system. Now, with that conversation back and forth, we can get good produce and have it you know, planned out ahead of time. We can count on it. And, uh, and the other thing that we do in this, in this town, which I think is so awesome, is our pea patch program. Uh, all over the city of Seattle, there's, there's gardens, and 10% of the gardens are 
donated to the food bank. There's actually plots right around the pea patches. And that to get a plot, you have to commit to working a certain amount of hours on that food bank garden. And what a synergy that is. What a beautiful neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor function that is. And uh, I, I think it's awesome. Are there ways to reduce food waste at home? Uh, yes, absolutely. I think the number one thing, at least that's what we found out, was you don't do a once-a-week shop. You do like they do in Europe. You, when, when you're hungry, you go to the store and you make dinner or you make yourself a meal. But this whole re massive refrigerator thing that we have in our houses mm -hmm. uh, is crazy because things get lost and then boom, next thing you know, they're going into the garbage. Mm -hmm. So, Well, when I go to Manhattan, for example, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, I, I see that every day. You're, I, actually, if I'm there for five days, I will see some of the same people who I know are residents, uh, or at least they appear to be residents, and they're in there getting their food for the day. And I just kind of like to go there and be with the, with the regular people. <laughs> uh, I, I don't necessarily see that when I go to other countries. Is that is it just an American phenomenon? or I think so. The, the weekly shop, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think that's particularly American. I, I don't know that it's wrong. You know, if it's canned or something like that, you know, who cares? But if it's a fresh produce, I think getting it every day uh, is the way to go. And mm -hmm. The question I would have is, is it efficient? you know, gas-wise, you know, does it make sense to stop every day? Uh, you know, it probably does. Yeah, well, in Manhattan, it's walking. So. It's walking, I know. Uh, so th so that's, that's why I have my pedometer on, because I have to do more walking. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is not the model of efficiency right here. Yeah, I, I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> uh, we're going to take advantage of it a little bit, uh, because people, the, uh, there is a, an opportunity for you to, uh, to learn from Tom and, and how to cook and cook efficiently. And I got to tell you, when I watched uh, one of your classes that you were giving. I was so hungry when I left there. I just, I, I had to eat an apple immediately. Um, is that something that you like to do when you that's give? Why, that's why you look like that. I would eat a piece of pizza. You eat an apple. <laughs> when, you give, when you give classes, uh, are, are people asking you continually about how do I make it taste better and be nutritious and not make me overweight at the same time? Well, that's certainly a concern. Um, uh, I think nutritious, taste better is the bigger concern. I think eating the right portion size is a, be is a better concern than worrying about whether it's going to make you fat or not. Um, I didn't get this way because I eat a night the right portion every time. I get this way because I drink too much and I eat the wrong things and blah, blah, blah. So um, there's a lot of concern out there. I think the biggest thing in the States right now, which I, we're really thrilled about as a company, I've actually hired a chief vegetable officer. We are really working hard to get more vegetables on our plates. And I would love to see the country, I, I'm certainly a, a meathead, believe me, but I don't need a 12 ounce steak. A four ounce steak is plenty and get that rainbow on the plate. Uh, and that's what I try to teach in my classes. We have 30 seconds left. What's the biggest impediment to ending hunger, not just here in the United States, but in the world? Boy, I think uh, malaise, I think um, inefficiencies, uh, you know, People just uh, not you know people just be thinking about themselves and not about the community as a whole. If if I were to change anything in that world, I would there would be a hunger tax and we would we would go to the grocery store and we would almost like pay it forward. Just you know every time we buy food, we we donate two dollars for the people that can't afford food. So I, I like that. That's Tom Douglas. TomDouglas.com. He is a, a restaurateur who is trying to end world hunger. Can change the world one life, one heart, one soul, one mind at a time.